Today is November 13, 2007. We are taping this interview in the studio of the Video Club of Laguna Woods Village, Laguna Woods, California. This is the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress of the United States in partnership with the Historical Society of Laguna Woods Village. Our guest today is Lillian Taylor. She was born on September 4th, 1921, and she served in the Army Nurse Corps. I am Carly Lutzo of the Vidi Club. Good morning, Lillian. So nice to have you come today and tell us about your experiences during World War II. Tell me, where, when were you born and where were you born? I was born in Butte, Montana in September 4th, 1921. And what did your parents do? Uh, my father was worked for uh, ACM, Anaconda Copper Mining Company, and my mother took care of four children. Oh, did you stay in Butte and go to school there? Yes, in my early years I attended school in uh, Butte, Montana. And on my 18th birthday, I entered Columbus Hospital School of Nursing in Great Falls, Montana. On your 18th birthday, did you get to train through very long? It was a three-year diploma school, and we had to make up any days that uh, we were ill, and fortunately, I didn't have any sick days, and we had three uh, weeks vacation a year, and the last two years, I didn't take any vacation. So I was the first one out uh, in April of 1942, and then I went to work for a small hospital as a graduate nurse until I could take my state boards. Uh, Montana didn't give state boards once only in uh, November. And so in November I took the state boards. I was 21 in September. I passed the boards and I applied for the Army, the Army Nurse Corps. And now what year is this now when uh, you applied? That was in 1942 I applied and uh, I received a notice to report to Campadere, Oregon, uh, January 12th, 1943. Uh-huh, is that where you were inducted? Yes. And then what was the next, what did you do at that camp? Uh, <clears throat> I worked uh, um, on a mumps ward. All the patients had mumps, I was very surprised. Uh, <laughs> Army hospitals are, were different than civilian hospitals. It had a long ward, a long room mm -hmm. uh, with about 40 patients, maybe 20 beds on each side of uh, the aisle, and um, a nurse's office and a doctor's office and a supply room. and. Um, most of the patients had the same disease, so I, and I didn't have, I never had the mumps. Did you get it? No, I didn't. Are I carried lucky? out very strict isolation technique, and I was fortunate I didn't get the mumps. How long did you stay at that? I hospital? was there three months, and uh -huh. then I was transferred to Camp uh, Hahn, California. It's out by Riverside. And uh, I stayed there until I got orders to go overseas. What, uh, did, what did your parents think about you uh, going into the Army Nurse Corps? Uh, they were very happy about it. Uh, they thought it was the right thing to do. The, after Pearl Harbor, uh, the, it seemed the entire nation came together to try to do something to to help with the war efforts. And I know my mother had never worked and she went to the Red Cross and made bandages and uh, because in those days the nurses had to make all their own bandages, clean all their equipment. Oh, really? Clean the rooms, yes, in the early, the early days. And then they, uh, people were buying war bonds and, and the victory gardens and, and doing everything they could. And the men were all being drafted or enlisting and uh, 
So uh, every, almost every nurse in my class enlisted in the Army or, or the Navy. Or the or Navy. The, so you were at which camp now? I, camp Hahn. In, it was out by March Field uh -huh. in, by Riverside, California. Riverside. And what, was that a training space mm -hmm. or just a waiting place to go over? No, that was a hospital. Uh -huh. camp. It was an Army hospital. And, and there I worked several different uh, services, uh -huh. uh, mostly on a gastrointestinal service. Uh, the patients had uh, uh, ulcers, gastro, gastro ulcers. And, but I worked uh, ear, nose, and throat there. And uh, then everybody was assigned to a unit. Mm -hmm. And when your unit left, yeah, to go overseas, you left. And we lived out of a suitcase, and if we went into Riverside uh, to shop, we had to tell what stores we were going into, so that if our unit was called, that uh, they, they, they could get a hold of us right away. And while I was there, uh, 12 units left, they all went to Europe. Mine was the 13th, and I met the. I was sent to um, Camp Stoneman with a, another nurse from there and a doctor, and we joined the 80th General Hospital and we went to the Pacific. And how long were you um, at that last hospital, with with the? Um, oh, I was there the nine months. <clears throat> months. I was there nine months. And then when you so, when you were ready to go to the Pacific, where, from where did you go? Well, <clears throat> the, the port of debarkation was Camp Stone, okay. uh, California, by Pittsburgh, uh -huh. and we were there three days, and we were uh, issued foot lockers and uh, fatigues and tropical gear and. Uh, uh, three days later, we marched into Pittsburgh, and uh, was um, we followed the troops to, into Pittsburgh, and we had never had any basic training, and I don't know how long, how far Pittsburgh is, but we had a musette bag and carrying our suitcases. And for, I think it's about three miles. And, and, you, and the you only thing that there? kept us going was the troops in front of us were loaded down so much more than we were. But when we started, it was raining. So we had these heavy trench coats on. And halfway there, the sun came out and it stopped raining. So uh, we. We got on a ferry, and they took us to San Francisco, and we boarded the SS Lurline, <clears throat> which was a luxury liner. Oh, the Lurline liner. had been turned into a troop ship. It was turned into a troop ship, and uh, three weeks later, we landed in New Guinea. In New Guinea. So, well, tell us about what you did in New Guinea. <clears throat> well, first we were in a staging area until our hospital was built. And um, did you say until your hospital yes, was built? Yes, they had to build the hospital. <laughs> oh my goodness! And uh, <clears throat> it was culture shock in New Guinea. Uh, there was one road, a dirt road that went along the coast, and right in back of the road was a small hill, and then the Owen Stanley Mountains, huge, were in back. Uh, the New Guinea Harbor was a very good harbor for our ships. And um, in 1942, actually, uh, General MacArthur drove the Japanese back over the Owen Stanley Mountains, and the, the battle at Guadalcanal saved Australia. Australia was thinking of moving everybody from Brisbane back, evacuating them because the Japanese were ready to uh, invade Australia until the Battle of, of New Guinea. And uh, we set up a hospital uh, in New Guinea, the same like I told you that we're mm -hmm. 
wards and, and then same, hospital, same layout, huh? hospital ships brought the patients uh, in. Uh, and we also received patients from the base because there were a lot of tropical diseases. We had a lot of malaria and dengue fever and um, typhus, scrub typhus fever and worms, loads of different kinds of worms and uh, invaded the body. Is this from the, the food body. that they were eating? Or the, no, the, the worms were native to the, to the, to the, the New Guinea. New, New Guinea. Um, and like there was one worm that if you went barefoot, it, it just invaded the skin and then it would invade all the organs of the body and um, come up and get into the esophagus and go back down into the lung, the, the, the tropical. Uh, we had a course in tropical diseases and uh, we were thankful for that. Were you able to treat people? Yeah, at that time, there were, was very little to treat them with. That was the time, first time the penicillin came out and that was really a miracle drug. Before that, the sulfadiazine and the sulfa were, uh, but penicillin uh, we, uh, had to be given every three hours around the clock. And uh, so the wounds that we received, the patients had were a lot of belly wounds and chest wounds and amputations and the penicillin saved a lot of lives. Uh, the uh, uh, where there was the, a fungus in New Guinea. Well, there was a fungus all over the tropics that caused these ulcers. They call it jungle rot. Uh -huh. And they had deep ulcers on the legs and all over your body, and the only thing we had to treat that with was like sulfadiazine powder and uh, um, tincture of iodine and saline uh, packs. And, uh, and the, did you contract uh, any of it yourself? Uh, no, I was very fortunate. I did. Well, everybody got dysentery. <laughs> There was a maybe dysentery caused by a parasite, and then the bacillary dysentery caused from bacteria, uh, like food poisoning. And uh, the amoebic dysenteries were usually sent home. Uh, the, they had three drugs called carbosone, dioticlin, and quinidine that, uh, to treat them with but they were very hard on the heart. And malaria, the only thing to treat malaria was quinine. And uh, we had soldiers with repeated attacks of malaria. And uh, all personnel had to take Adabrine uh, daily mm, to hopefully ward off ma malaria. Uh, it, uh, it didn't do a very good job and everybody got yellow skin and yellow eyes and you could tell who the old timers were in the tropics by their color, <laughs> their skin and their eyes. And um, were you a, were you, was that area a quiet area or were there, was there actually battles on there? At, at my time in Milne Bay, it was there were no battles uh -huh. there, but the fighting was in northern New Guinea at that time. It, um, Milne Bay was used for um, fueling. Uh -huh. the, you know, the airplanes at that time needed to fuel, refuel much. <laughs> And so it was a refueling station to go on to um, Australia and New Zealand. And then, of course, the harbor brought in all, a lot of ships there. And the like uh, ordnance and quartermaster, and they were all behind the lines. 
But actually, the fighting wasn't very far from us up the line in New Guinea. It took, I, it took from March when I arrived there until the following September to take uh, Hollandia, which is the northern tip of New Guinea. And um, the, the jungle was so thick with this, what they call kunai grass, K-U-N-A-I grass that they could only uh, go through with a machete, could only uh -huh. cut it with a machete. So the only thing that was um, not jungle was the area that they cleared out around the coast. Mm -hmm. And um, there were two seasons in New Guinea. It was hot all the time. And we had six months of rain and uh, real rain. We'd go to work in the morning and go through rivers of rain. And then there were six months of hot and dry. And, um, but all the, the, we had some fun. You know, we were, there were only 200 women um, in New Guinea, in Millie Bay when I was there. And uh, there were 100 nurses in our outfit. And we had lived in uh, 50 to a hut. And um, we had <clears throat> a cot with no, with no mattress, two blankets, and a footlocker. And we hung, the, they put nails on the posts were for our mosquito netting, and we would hang our musette bag and our canteen and so forth on the, on the nails. And um, we had eight whole latrines, outhouses, and everything was on stilts so that uh, the water ran through, you know. And uh, we had did have showers. They were cold water showers, but they didn't need heat. Um, and they were eight showers on a platform, no roof over it, and but sides around it. And so that's we shot, were able to shower. And <clears throat> the natives were uh, called, were Micronesians, and especially during the dry season, they came in. They were very friendly. The women wore only skirts, and the men wore just a palm leaf right in front of their genitals. And they would climb a coconut tree and bring us out a coconut for a cigarette. And the more skirts the women had, the more wealth they considered. Oh. And uh, I was fortunate. I got to visit a village. Um, and um, they were, they liked to chew betel nuts, so their teeth were all red. But they another form of their wealth were pigs. And I witnessed a lady uh, nursing a baby on one breast and a little piglet on the other breast. Oh my goodness. That, that, <laughs> and uh, so I, I really did get culture shock there. Well, how, and how, how did you react to that? Um, <clears throat> I, I didn't say anything. Of course, they spoke of pidgin English. I mean, but that the, was their culture. So the, the whole situation. Uh, you were only in your twi early twenties. Well, everything was like a moving picture to me. Except, uh, wasn't real. <laughs> I know the jungle and and the cries at night and what I didn't like were the rats and the, and the mice and the, and uh, I went in a latrine one day and I happened to be the only one in there and this log that I stepped over moved. Oh. And I don't know whether it was a boa constrictor or a python or what it was, but I, I got out of there and <laughs> stepped over that log and called the guard and stayed there and warned nobody to go in that latrine. They shot it. 
you know, they killed it. It was a huge snake, the length of the That's screen. That's scary. And, the, and about that high. But, mm. Well, that... And the food was pretty, was barely edible. And um, it consisted of spam. You'd get, they'd get a shipment of spam in and you'd eat spam morning, noon, and night for a couple of months. And then they get bully beef, and it uh, comes in a can. It's strings of meat with a lot of fat in it. And then they would get Vienna sausages, and then they would get mutton from Australia. When they got the mutton from Australia, I tried to get a date with the Navy, because the Navy had good food. You couldn't go near the, the mess hall. The odor was so bad. Did, did, did the natives bring in food that you were able to eat? The, no, I said I tried to get with a date with the Navy. Uh -huh. See, we were allowed to date. We worked 12 hours a day, and we had one day a week off. And unless a shipment of patients came in, and you worked around the clock till got everybody settled. And the patients stayed until the ship came to pick them home and take them home. Now, each club, each outfit, like ordnance and quartermaster and so forth, had a club. And the club would usually consist of one room. Some of the floors were dirt floors. We had uh, wear suntans, um, pants, men's pants, men's shirts, leggings, and oxfords. That was the dress of the day. And, uh, but each club had a nice band because there were a lot of musicians in the area that got together and played. And so we went to dances almost every night. And uh, like I say, there were a lot of dirt floors, but that's where I learned to dance. Uh, I, <laughs> I didn't know how. I would just say, "Please teach me." Uh -huh. So the and uh, so that was our recreation. Uh, we also had outdoor theaters, and I sat in the rain with the rain running down my glasses and watched the good earth uh, in the rain. So uh, that was, and then of course the patients. Uh, I, I like to, uh, I, I don't like to nurse in one area. I like to float and nurse in a lot of different areas so that I learn and take care of uh, many different things. Many different. And so I float, did a lot of floating. Mm -hmm. I worked in the, on the psych wards and uh, Oh, another thing we had that was very sad all, all over the Pacific was um, jungle juice. There were, we had there, nothing to drink. They didn't have any alcoholic drinks in New Guinea. And they made jungle juice. And it what was, was it fermented made? anything. Fermented the, anything. The, <laughs> fermented anything, the, the men. Uh, drank shaving lotion, anything with alcohol in it. And we'd get these patients in and they would go blind and we had a lot of deaths because, because they drank the jungle juice. Oh my goodness. They, they How fermented, awful. Yeah, fermented anything they had. Well, that's um, quite a picture of life in it was in that area of New Guinea. What happened to after that? Did you? How long was, did you stay in that particular? <clears throat> I was camp? there nearly a year, and then we went to Biak Island, mm -hmm. um, just staging, waiting to go to Luzon on the Philippines. Mm -hmm. We were only there on Biak about six or eight weeks, and uh, <clears throat> that's where. Um, I ran into the rats that would come into the tent. We lived in little tents, two to a tent, kind of like a pup tent. And they would come in and at midnight, 
every night and run up the poles of mosquito netting and jump in and uh, oh I just lie there. How <laughs> awful. And um, there were still Japanese on the island who were in the caves. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were 30 of us uh, out away from the main base. The main base was the airfield. Mm -hmm. And the Japanese were in caves in the back there. And when the main base would bring a movie out to us, and one night, uh, the Japanese, two or three Japanese came out of the caves and came down to watch the movie. Oh, but they, they, were, <laughs> they didn't attack you? Yeah. Oh, no, they were, Just, they were for, caught. They were caught. They were caught. But they but, came to uh, watch the yeah. movie. Well, it must have been. But then we went to Luzon, and uh, we went to Clark Air Base, and we were in the battle zone. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> the colonel, of the 24th, it was the 24th Field Hospital at Clark Air Base. And he asked, told us they'd been overseas two years and they had never worked with any women and they had even scarcely seen any women. And he asked us to please go on the wards and just and help the men. They had all had nine months of surgical training and the only reason we were there was because they needed help. Mm -hmm. And we were the first nurses to work in a field hospital really? in the, the Pacific. And so uh, he took us, they had a, a huge auditorium and there were 400 patients in the auditorium all in cots, some were on the stage and they were all battle casualties. And the fighting at that time was a mile and a half away. They were fighting for a Japanese um, motor pool. And uh, he told us not to leave the barbed area. He said it was very dangerous. So we, uh, and then he took us to the tents. There were a lot of patients in tents with the, like I told you, the tropical diseases. Uh, and then there were other tents of dermatitis, uh, general rot. <clears throat> How long did so, you stay there? Well, I was there four months. And then where did you And then to Manila. To Manila. And when I got into Manila, that was still a battle zone. The city proper had been pretty well cleared out, but they were fighting all around. Uh, when General Yamashita uh, retired re with his army to Baguio, he declared it an open city, the same as General MacArthur had declared it an open city when he went to Bataan. And uh, a naval officer told his men to fight to the death. <clears throat> and that's what happened in Manila. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they fought room for room for that gorgeous Manila Hotel, and they fought room for room in almost every building, and Manila was in rubble. The Japanese dynamited a lot of the buildings before the, uh, they didn't leave. They fought to the death. and. There in Manila, there was an old Spanish city called the Walled City. And the Japanese trapped a lot of the civilians, Filipino civilians in that city and bayoneted them and killed them and uh, tortured them. And they did that all over the entire city. And mm, we had a lot of casualties in the hospital and a lot of diseases, uh, the tropic, mostly the tropical diseases. And you and still I, managed not to get anything? Uh, no, uh, no, that's when I, I got kidney stones. Well, I had dysentery. Everybody had dysentery off and on. Mm -hmm. I had bacillary and we, sulfaguanidine usually cleared that up. The amoebic dysentery you sent home. And in Manila, I worked in the uh, field hospital. I worked in triage 
where they came and you decided who was going to go into the operating room right away and who was going to the shock room and uh, then and then I worked the post-op uh, surgical floor. But when I got to Manila, I had uh, an amoebic dysentery ward, a bacillary and amoebic dysentery. And my, room, my ward stunk <laughs> because for you have to keep, patients have to give you a stool specimen daily. And you have to keep the stools warm to send them to the lab. They had to be warm in those days. Today you don't. They have preservatives and so forth. But you had to keep them warm. So the lab had to have a warm stool to find the amoeba, if there was amoeba. So I had, I improvised. I uh, had hot water bottles lined up on a table and little lights over the table and for all the stool specimens there. Oh, goodness. And, <laughs> and, Good for you. And, uh, and then they were able to do Then they were sent to the lab warm, uh -huh. see. And, uh, but we, then we had a lot of kidney stones. And um, because we had to drink out of Lister bags, the water was highly chlorinated. And the, there we worked uh, more than 12 hours a day, and we didn't. We only. <clears throat> we didn't have any days off. We worked 30 days and then had a, a day off, and then we worked 30 nights and had a night off, and then we worked 30 days. And then we didn't have enough help. And I got kidney stones, and um, I was in and out of the hospital um, until I'd pass them. And then, uh, uh, but that in the dysentery, I lost a lot of weight with the dysentery. I was, I was down to around 90 pounds. Oh my goodness. Uh, you were telling me a story about a soldier that lost an eye that you were. Oh, with. that was in New Guinea. That was it. Tell us about that. <clears throat> yes, in New Guinea, he was uh, in a foxhole and he was with the infantry and a Jap jumped into the foxhole with the bayonet in the middle of the night, just swinging the bayonet. They couldn't see each other. And it was raining. It was, uh, the foxhole was half full. It was up to his knees with water. And he lashed out to the, the bayonet, hit his eye, knocked it. He eviscerated his eye, but did not touch his brain. He was so fortunate. Wasn't he, it? He lashed out with his bayonet, and he managed to kill the Jap. And then he called for a medic, and uh, he landed in our hospital on my ward. And of course, I had him for several weeks until um, a ship would come in and take them home. Goodness sake. Well, let's go back to Manila. Then you had kidney stones. Did you stay in Manila, or did you? Did they send you someplace? No, I stayed in Manila after you passed. While you're passing the stone, you have severe pain. Oh yes. And after you, when you, when the stone stops moving, the pain stops. So, and then after you pass the stone, you know, then, but then I had had start having one after another. Oh. Uh -huh. And then I had one high in the kidney that uh, that um, it gave me a lot of problems. So after. The war ended. Uh -huh. uh, they decided to send me home. I was hospitalized, and they decided to send me home in November. The About war ended in August, and they sent me home in November. Uh -huh. And I came home with prisoners of war from Japan. They are prisoners of war who were on Japan or on Bataan that were captured and they were sent to Nagasaki working as slave labor. I came home with a lot of them and we, we flew home. Uh, the, um, and the trip was a, uh, we flew to, in a C-54. They made a medical 
plane out of it. You were in a hammock, rows of you in a hammock on the plane, and they had a flight nurse. And you flew first to um, Guam. And they refueled at Guam, and then they flew to Kwajalein, and they refueled at Kwajalein, and then you flew to Hawaii, and then the last leg was to San Francisco, which was a 13-hour trip. And by the time they got to San Francisco, the pilots were praying that San Francisco would not be fogged in because they would barely have enough fuel to land. But you did get down. Uh, yes, and uh, I flew, well, first, uh, yes, I got to Letterman well, did, did General. You, did they send you a hospital then? Yes, I was at Letterman General in San Francisco. And then I was sent to Madigan General Hospital at Fort Lewis uh, for an operation. Well, when I arrived at Fort Lewis, uh, that was the uh, hospital at Madigan that they sent all the prisoners of war, uh, uh, our prisoners. And um, they triaged us because there were so many pr uh, pr patients there. So, of course, the first ones were uh, seen first, the, all these prisoners, and uh, and uh, I was there six weeks before I saw a doctor. Oh, six yeah. weeks before you saw a doctor? Well, that's how many patients were there that needed help. See, they were all much worse off than I was. Uh, um, they allowed us to leave in the morning the ambulatory patients, if you signed out and signed back in, in the, uh, at six o'clock in the evening. And then they, and uh, I met um, a major who'd been captured on Bataan, and uh, he lived in Tacoma, and his parents had saved his car. And I was very fortunate, four of us, uh, went sightseeing in Tacoma up to Seattle. Um, and so, and in the meantime, I passed the stone and I didn't need the operation. And you didn't need the operation. Yeah, but it, he, he, so I, the, I got my discharge at Fort Lewis. You were discharged at Fort Lewis, and do you remember the year? Yes, 1946. Okay. Well, January, uh, I went in January 9th to 1946, I was just, or 1943, and I was discharged January 12th, 1946. Well, you had quite a time and adventure and <laughs> saw many things that you would probably never have seen oh, if you hadn't yes, been in the nurse yes, corps. Yes, and right. survived all these different kinds of... Yes, I was very fortunate. Yes. I didn't get any of the tropical diseases. Yeah. Did you make any good friends while you were in, at, in the nurse corps, among the nurses, or did they? Uh, I had uh, one very good friend, but she was also from Montana. Uh -huh. And we were both stationed at Camp Han together. And um, we, we were together a lot. Did you, did you keep up with anybody after you got out, or did you? She and I kept up for a long time, and uh, I... So About now three been... years ago, I lost her. I lost track of her. Mm -hmm. Quit answering my letters, everything. I don't know what happened to okay. her. After you were discharged, uh, did you go to school? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Did you use the I, GI Bill? <laughs> I, I felt that the best thing that the government ever did was the GI Bill. It educated uh, my generation because we worked so hard in uh, high school to get enough money to go to college. And uh, to have the GI Bill, yeah, I was fortunate in my three years of nurses training that I had all my classes at the uh, College of Great Falls, Montana. We, and they were all upper division classes. So, 
uh, but I didn't have a degree, so I, I worked at the Veterans Hospital in Salt Lake City, and at the same time, I took advantage of the GI Bill. I, <clears throat> I worked four to midnight, uh, and I went to the University of Utah days in the morning, and uh, I um, you, what took, degree did you? I got take? a degree in psychology, uh -huh. and you'll ask me why I took psychology. The reason I I could get all morning classes in psychology, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and still work. Uh -huh. I didn't accept the the money from the government, but the free education, and I had a, a very fine job at the Veterans Hospital. Um, I was uh, one of the super supervisors, and I supervised the four to a midnight shift. And I didn't want to get a job up, so. Uh, when you got your degree, did you stay at the Veterans Hospital? No, I was married. I, uh, as soon as I came home, I married a man that I had known since I was 15. And we both, uh, went to the University of Utah, and uh, we both graduated together. And then we left, I, by this time I'm 30, and I felt, you know, I wanted a couple of children, so uh, I, I had one son when I was 30, and then another one at 34. But <clears throat> I worked. We moved to Seattle and I didn't work for a couple of years, but then I went back to work and uh, I didn't quit until I came here. To, oh, <laughs> what was your maiden uh, name? Uh, Sweet, mm -hmm. Lillian Margaretta Sweet. And then you, when you married, it was Taylor. Taylor. So you came to California with children and your husband? Or was yes, yes. And where uh, did you come? He, whereabouts did you come? Uh, well, first we went to Salinas. He worked for the YMCA, and I worked at the uh, Salinas Valley Memorial Hospital there, and I worked on the medical floor there, and we were there 10 years, and he took a job in, um, at Alhambra YMCA. So I interviewed a lot of hospitals, and the uh, City of Hope offered me a job, but I, the only uh, way out there was Arrow Highway at that time. And so I uh, drove out there, but it was an hour drive, and I didn't want to be that far away from, the, from my boys. So, no, so I went to work at uh, San Gabriel Valley Medical Center. And I went up to the up the ladder, and I became an assistant chief nurse uh, before I retired. And my son, my youngest son, when he was at the University of California at Irvine, I came to see him, and that's when I really discovered what le leisure world was. Oh, that was how you got and, started. <clears throat> so when I was sixty. So almost 67, I I moved here. You moved here, and you moved in. So I'm on my 20th year. You're on your 20th <laughs> year, so you came in about 87. Huh? Right, right. I came um, in in 87, July of 80, July 1st of 87. And both your sons are nearby, or or neither one? No, um, <clears throat> my youngest son, the one that went to UCI, he lives in Hesperia, and he has two daughters, one's 12 and one's 16. Mm -hmm. My oldest son is an engineer with Burlington Northern uh, Railroad, and he worked out of Vancouver, Washington for a long time. Now he's in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and um, I think he'll be going to Texas and Alabama. He does, he was married, but he doesn't have any children. Oh, well. Um, so I had when you got to Leisure World and retired, what did you um, decide to do with your life that you could do here? Uh, <clears throat> well, of course, uh, my passion is ballroom dancing. 
And my swimming, I was a lifeguard and, and uh, water safety instructor during high school, and I always kept up the swimming. I loved to snorkel, and so I swim three quarters of a mile, three times a week, and uh, I joined uh, two ballroom dancing clubs. I Wait, came did your here. husband come with you, or had you? no? Uh, we after my son went to college, we separated. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, we remained very friendly. In fact, we still went dancing together. But, oh, nice! But uh, uh, he went to Salt Lake City, and I came here. And uh, well, I know you got involved uh, writing with writing, when, how did that happen? Well, <clears throat> that was always um, after the war. I thought, well, someday I'm gonna write a book about uh, your experiences. So um, after I retired here, I started in earnest to write. And I wrote for about five years. Uh, the um, writing the experiences of, uh, were, was like a moving picture. Everything from 1943 to 46 is still in your mind. It's like a moving picture. So writing about the patients, the diseases, the nurses, the way we lived, everything, and the plots and subplots I uh, wrote from experiences that I saw the nurses and I experienced myself. That was a difficult, but then I wanted to research the background military, and I spent a lot of time so I'd make sure that the background military was Correct. authentic. Yeah. And you and, produced a book, though. Uh, well, it took me about five years to write it, and another five years to send out every publishing company that would... That Show us the book. Oh, got, the I think book? you brought it with you. Show us the cover. Well, uh, it's called it's Magical Love in Tropical Hell. It was Tropical Hell. Sounds like and, I believe you. Uh, the magical love part comes the way the nurses, some of the nurses coped with what they were taking care of. and, and uh, Is it about you or is it... Oh, I'm a mixture. Is some of it about you? It's I'm a mixture in there. All all my friends are mixtures in here. Yeah. Is it a story or is it a, a, a like a factual uh, documentary? Uh, uh, the plots are fiction, uh -huh. but the way we lived and it's all true. The way we lived, the patients, the diseases, all that is true. The background military information, of course, is all true. The plots are not true. Well, I think that's wonderful. But they that's are true. based on experiences yes. that I saw. I made a story out of them. Wonderful. Are you writing something else now? Yes, I've done a lot of writing, but trying to find a, a publisher. The, <clears throat> there's one book that I, I really want would like to see published. The second one I wrote um, is about middle school and teen children who take drugs and what happens to them. Now the first one, and I got all of these out of the register. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would see these articles in the register, so I wrote a story about them, researched the drugs so it would be very authentic, and wrote it in language that a middle school child can understand. The first one I saw where a boy sniffed Clorox in Newport, oh, and really? another one at Huntington oh. Beach, 12 year olds. Oh my. And uh, they both died. Boy. So the story I wrote is a boy who's sniffing, who is getting CPR in a hospital, and he is watching himself getting CPR, and he hears the doctor and the nurse talking. And so he's saying to himself, 
what the nurse and the doctor uh, and they're talking about the Clorox, the sniffing, how they start. And the boy is saying that he's saying he started with his airplane glue. And then, <clears throat> then they're giving him CPR, and he said he knows what CPR is. And, and the doctor said he has a straight line, and the boy says to himself, he has, I know what that is, my heart stopped, please get it re working again. And <clears throat> so in the end, he's screaming to please no, tell his mother that he's already started his four-year-old brother oh. sniffing his airplane glue because he thought it was funny to see him stagger around and then the boy dies. I so. think that would be a very good story. And I, I have 20 stories like that. Uh -huh. Half of them are from drugs uh -huh. that I saw in the paper. The other half are um, sexually transmitted diseases uh -huh. of young that I read in the paper. Do you have and a title for the book? Um, Hooked in Middle School. Well, I think and, I would these hope were all middle school children. I would hope you could get it published because that's I better. hope I can too. All right. Um, did you join any veterans organizations <laughs> or stay with the any, anything that had to do with the nurse corps after you got out? No, I didn't. Uh, all officers were automatically put on the uh, indirect reserve. Yeah. Like when the Korean War came along. I had been assigned to a unit, and if my unit had been called to the Did Korean War, I would have had I would have had to go. Yes. Did you go? No, no. no. My unit wasn't called. You, I was oh, at I, the and we made uh, at that time. Today, you know, women are pregnant in the in the service, anyway. have their children, and then they leave, and. Um, um, my son's wife uh, has a son by a former marriage that's 30, and uh, he married a girl who was in the service, and she got pregnant. And four months later, she was sent to Iraq after the baby was born. Oh my goodness! She went to Iraq, and he's been in Germany taking care of the baby while. And he has him in, in a. <laughs> he works in, a po in the postal service over there. Oh my now goodness. she's due back from Iraq in November, but I was I was during my time in World War II. If you were pregnant, you could you go. couldn't. You had to get out. I would hope so. And we had a case uh, in New Guinea that was deliberate. Yeah. Well, we've covered a lot of your life, and we're coming to the close of our interview. Is there anything else you'd like to add about well, your service life, just for a minute or so, no, or I about feel your I've, life now? I feel I've had a marvelous life. I had a wonderful life. I wish I had ten. I would like to have ten more lives. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, Laguna Woods Village. I still keep calling it Leisure World, but I know. Laguna Woods Village has been absolute paradise. And um, everybody here has a good story, and everybody is so active. They want, well, we're even certain. with disabilities, they're active. <laughs> they they keep their brains active. And, that's right. And Isn't that wonderful? Active. Yes, I'm so happy to be here. It's absolute paradise. It's Isn't that? Oh, I'm so glad. And you. And I, I thank won't you go into for it. having me. But we won't go into it. But I know you're part of the Writers Club now. Yes, and, I joined the Writers Club. And that's a very and interesting group of people. Yes, and I found that uh, everybody in the Writers Club has the same problem I have. The publishing. The publishing industry has. Um, is closed practically. Yeah. You go through the writer's market, they tell you to buy the writer's yeah. market. It's agent submissions only yeah. uh, in very about three-fourths of it. It's very, very, very difficult. difficult. Well, but you keep trying. Oh, sure, Where just keep trying. Happen?
<laughs> Thank you so much, Lillian. You've had yeah. one of the most complete looks at life in the service during the t time that you were a nurse and all that you experienced that, that we have had uh, in oh, interviews in the last you very much. Like 400 I, people. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so thank you very much.